Welcome back to an introduction to oceanography and chapter 10 of Essentials of Oceanography. That's the seventh edition by Tom Garrison. And today we are talking about tides and tides are actually uh, waves. They are forced waves. They are forced by gravity and inertia. And uh, they are the, uh, the waves on the planet that have the longest wavelength. And they are essentially short term changes in ocean surface height. The equilibrium theory of tides explains tides by examining the balance of and effects of forces that allow our planet to stay in orbit around the sun or the moon to the orbit the earth. Because of the nearness to earth, our moon actually has a greater influence in our tides than the sun. So the equilibrium theory basically is looking at the gravitational pull of the sun and the moon to explain tides. The dynamic theory takes into account those items, but also seabed contour, water viscosity, and inertia. Together, the equilibrium and dynamic theories allow tides to be predicted uh, not only for tomorrow, but uh, actually years in advance. And one of the great things about tides, other than knowing when high and low tide will be, uh, to know when the, the best surf is going to be, you can also extract power from tidal flow. All right, so tides are the longest of all ocean waves. Periodic, short-term changes in the height of the ocean surface at a particular place caused by the gravitational force of the moon and sun and the motion of the earth. The wavelength of tides can be half the circumference of earth and are the longest of all waves. Tides are considered forced waves because they are never free from the forces that cause them, specifically never free from gravity. The equilibrium theory of tides explains many characteristics of ocean tides. The ocean surface is presumed always to be in equilibrium, that is, in balance with the forces that are acting upon it. And the dynamic theory of tides explains the characteristics of ocean tides based on the gravity of the sun and the moon and the characteristics of fluid motion and also the seabed in the shape of ocean basins and the shape of the basins that tides are acting in. So, the equilibrium theory, again, basically is looking at the gravitational forces playing to force the waves. The dynamic theory takes into all the other subtler aspects. And that dynamic theory makes tide calculations a very complex thing. It's not a, it's not a simple thing at all. Very, very complex formulas go into it. But once those formulas are solved, we essentially can know the tides for years into the future. Gravity, as we know, holds bodies together. A planet orbits the sun in balance between gravity and inertia. If the planet is not moving, gravity will pull it into the sun. If the planet is moving, the inertia of the planet will keep it moving in a straight line. In a stable orbit, gravity and inertia are in balance and cause a planet to travel in a fixed path around the sun. So, A, you have a non-moving planet being pulled toward the sun, and B, you have a planet that is moving in a direction in a straight line. And of course, remember that um, uh, bodies tend to move in a straight line unless another force of acceleration acts upon them. And so the gravity is that other force causing the, um, the motion of the planet to be in not necessarily a circle, but more like an ellipse around the sun. So the pull of gravity between two bodies is proportional. Now, this is what the force of gravity is. Pull of gravity is proportional to the masses of the bodies. That's M1 and M2. But it is inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. Uh, hence, heavier objects generate more gravity, and the further the di distance between two objects, the less gravity there's going to be. Heavy bodies are attracted more strongly than bodies, uh, and bodies close together are attracted more strongly. So tides, again, are forced waves formed by gravity and inertia. Tides are caused by the gravitational force of the moon and the sun, and even though the sun is 27 million times as massive as the moon, its great distance from the earth means that its influence on our tides is about 46% of the moon's influence on our tides. That doesn't mean the moon exerts 54% and the, the sun exerts 46%. That means the, the uh, power that's exerted by the moon, the sun's influence is only 46% of that. Newton's gravitational model to describe the Earth's tides is known as the equilibrium theory and mainly considers the attractions of Earth, Moon, and Sun while giving some consideration to ocean depth or the position of continents. The modification to the equilibrium theory is that dynamic theory, which does take into account the wavelength of the wave, the water depth relationships, the positions of the continents, ocean basins, 
the density of water, uh, the seafloor topography, or what's known as bathymetry, and lots of other very subtle effects that change how tides work in different basins. The movement of the moon generates what's known as strong tractive forces. So in this example, we see the distance between the Earth and the moon and the mass of the Earth being 81 times the mass of the moon. And what we know then is that the pivot point around which both the Earth and the moon spin is this point just inside the Earth's surface. So the moon does not rotate around the center of Earth. The Earth and the moon together create the Earth-Moon system and they rotate around a common center. So uh, the, the, this common center is that, uh, the common center of mass is that point about a thousand miles beneath the Earth's surface. That's where that fulcrum of that, uh, of that lever is. Uh, they're just about a thousand miles inside their surface. So the combination of the outward force of inertia, remember the moon is moving in a straight line, and the inward force of gravity are known as uh, the attractive forces. So we can see that the average Earth-Moon distance goes from the center of the Earth to the center of the moon, um, but because the Earth is so much more massive than the moon, the point at which the two revolve around each other is actually inside the Earth's surface. So the moon's gravity attracts the ocean toward it. The motion of the Earth around the center of mass of the Earth-Moon system throws up a bulge on the side of Earth opposite of the moon. The combination of the two effects creates two tidal bulges. So in the first illustration, you can see where the, the attractive force of the moon, the gravity of the moon, literally pulls the ocean surface toward it, and it creates a bulge on that side of the Earth. The Earth spinning around that center of mass of the Earth-Moon system then forces an opposing bulge on the opposite side of the Earth. It's the, it's the motion around that center. It's moving around that center, and that creates that opposite or that opposing bulge. And the combination is, at any, any given moment, you have a bulge created by the gravity of the Moon, essentially pointing toward the Moon, and on the opposite side of the Earth, you have a bulge in the sea surface. This, is, this bulge represents the sea surface. Without the moon, the sea surface would be flat around the Earth. With the moon, as you see in the left illustration, there's a bulge toward the moon because of the motion of the Earth in the Earth-Moon system. There's a bulge away from the moon, and the combined result is this bulge in the sea surface pointing toward the moon and pointing away from the moon. Those are the high tides. The center of that bulge is the high tide, and as you know, the Earth revolves on its axis. It spins on its axis and it's that spinning on its axis that then causes any given beach to go from high tide to low tide, back to high tide to low tide. So here's a, a very detailed explanation of this, and you should take a few moments, maybe pause the video, uh, and, and read some of the very specifics about this, where you have different forces at different points on the Earth, a force is created by inertia, um, forces created by gravity, attractive forces, um, and then how they all sort of balance together. In the end, um, the two forces that move the ocean, which is one is inertia, the inertia on the planet's surface because of our motion around the Earth-Moon system, and the gravitational attraction of the Moon, they are precisely equal in strength, but they are opposite in direction. So that inertia and the gravitational tr attraction to the moon is the same, but just in opposite directions. And so they balance, but they only really balance at the center of the Earth. That's the, uh, the center there, the CE point. The action of gravity and inertia on particles at five different locations on Earth are shown here. So we see it at one, two, three, four, and then uh, on five. At points one and two, the gravitational attraction of the moon slightly exceeds uh, the gravitational attraction then slightly exceeds the outward moving tendency of inertia. The imbalance of forces causes water to move along the Earth's surface, converging at a point toward the Moon. At 3 and 4, inertia exceeds the gravitational force, so water moves along the Earth's surface and converges at a point opposite the Moon. So it is that motion of the water along the Earth's surface, because on the side closest to the Moon, the gravitational attraction exceeds inertia, and on the side away from the moon, inertia exceeds gravitational attraction that causes the water to move along the Earth's surface and then bulge up there right in the center. And so again, 
you get a bulge toward the moon and a bulge opposite the moon. And the Earth, of course, is re revolving underneath that bulge. And that is how we go from high tide to low tide. So the movement of the moon generates those strong tractive forces. The water bulge resulting from inertia is on the back side of the Earth. Okay, and the water bulge resulting from gravitation is on the front side of the Earth. There is not a point on the Earth where the tractive forces are in equilibrium, only at the center of the Earth, okay? On the surface of the Earth, they're not. So the net tractive forces on the surface cause, causes the water to move toward those bulges, one pointing toward the moon and one pointing away from the moon. And again, looking at the Earth from, from the side, North Pole to South Pole, the movement of the planet from the west to the east, the spinning of the, the, the Earth, Counterclockwise, as you look down on top of it, means that at one point you're going to be under low tide and at another point you're going to be under high tide. The bulges stay aligned. Okay, the bulges stay aligned. The Earth-Moon system doesn't change dramatically over the course of 24 hours. It does. The, the Moon takes 28 and a half days to get around the Earth. So there is some movement of the, of the Moon along its path around the Earth, but in a given 24-hour period, um, it's it's... It's, it's nominal, and so that bulge essentially stays put. So the bulge stays aligned as the Earth spins on its axis. Earth's rotation beneath the tidal bulges produces high tides and low tides. And we can see, if we look at this, that the tidal cycle is about 24 hours and 50 minutes long. That's because the moon is going to come up about 50 minutes later each day because of its trip around the Earth every month or so, a little bit less than a month. And so it doesn't come up at the same time, it comes up a little bit later, and because of that, the tides change by anywhere between 50 and 40 to maybe 60 minutes a day, depending on which basin you're in. And again, we're looking down on the Earth. The Earth turns eastward, west to east, underneath the tidal bulges, and at one point, at 6.13 in the morning, you have high tide, and then at 12.26 you have low tide, and that's as that, that island that's showing in this illustration spins through that tidal bulge. The bulge isn't moving, the bulge is fixed. The Earth itself spins through that bulge. A lunar day is the time that elapses between the time the moon is highest in the sky and the next time it is highest in the sky. In a 24-hour solar day, the moon moves eastward by about 12.2 degrees. So Earth must rotate another 12.2 degrees, or about 50 minutes, to again place the Moon at its highest position overhead. So a lunar day is 24 hours and 50 minutes long, because Earth must turn an additional 50 minutes for the same tidal alignment. Lunar tides usually arrive about 50 minutes later each day. Now again, the dynamic theory tells us there's other factors involved that change that. So it's not always exactly 50 minutes, but it's about 50 minutes later each day. Lunar tides are tides caused by the gravitational and, inertial, and inertia interactions of the Moon and the Earth. And so there's the Moon directly overhead at the start, and then as you go around one solar day, the Moon has moved 12.2 degrees, and so you, got, you have to travel another 50 minutes to catch up to it. And that's why the tides aren't exactly aligned every day. That's why they're about 50 minutes later each day. So those tidal bulges will follow the moon. So the tidal bulge will move again with the moon and why our tides are different every day. The moon does not always stay directly above the equator and tidal bulges follow the moon. So not only is the moon moving ahead 12.2 degrees each day, it's not always directly aligned with the equator. And because it's not always directly aligned with that equator, that bulge is going to follow the moon. When the Moon's position is north of the equator, the gravitational bulge toward the Moon is also located north of the equator, and the opposite inertial bulge is below the equator on the opposite side of the Earth. So yes, the Sun does also influence the tides. Tides are caused by the gravitational force of the Moon and Sun, and even though the Sun is 27 million times as massive as the Moon, its great distance from the Earth means that its influence on our tides is only about 46% of the Moon's influence on our tides. The Sun's tractive forces develop the same way the Moon's, but smaller bulges follow the Sun through the day. So in reality, it's not just the one bulge of the Moon. 
there's going to be one large bulge on either side of the Earth because of the Moon and because of inertia, but there's also going to be a smaller bulge that is created by the Sun. So the Sun's tractive forces develop in the same way as the Moon, but smaller bulges follow the Sun to the day. Solar tides are caused by the gravitational and inertial forces of the Earth and Sun, very much the same way as with the Moon. Like the Moon, the Sun also moves from its position directly above the equator, although the Sun does it more slowly, so the position of the solar bulge varies just the same way as the position of the lunar bulge. And again, we're talking about that north and south of the equator. At the equinox, or the beginning of um, the fall, or the beginning of spring, the Sun is directly over the equator, and that's where the bulge would be. But when we go into the northern hemisphere winter and we're tilted away from uh, the sun, the bulge is down here over the Tropic of Capricorn. And so that's where the bulge will be. And same thing when we go into our, our uh, solstice in June, the sun is directly over the Tropic of Cancer, and that's where the bulge would be. If the sun and the moon are in line with the Earth, then the solar and lunar tides are additive, called spring tides. If the moon and Earth are at a right angle, then the solar tides will diminish, and the lunar tides are called neap tides. So this is re reference to the, the solar tides themselves. So I'll go back and it says, if the sun and the moon are in line, then the, then the solar and lunar tides are additive and they're called, um, they're called uh, spring tides. And if the earth and the, are at right angle with the moon, then the solar tide will diminish. The solar tide will diminish. Uh, and the lunar tide is called a, a neap tide. So that's what this looks like. So when you have a, a new moon, again, so here's the sun shining on the moon. It's shining on this side of the moon. So what we see at night is dark. That's a new moon. And here's the sun shining on the moon, and uh, other than some type of an eclipse, the full half of the moon is going to be illuminated, so that's going to be a full moon. And so um, when you have a, a, um, the moon on the opposite side, it's going to pull this bulge further out, and you have the, the moon on this side, it's going to pull this bulge further out. When the moon is at that right angle, okay, then the lunar bulge is here, and the lunar bulge is here and the solar bulge is here and so you've lessened the tides. In this situation you're adding the so solar and the lunar and you're adding the solar and the lunar and here you're subtracting them. So your high tides are going to be higher during your spring tide, the additive tides, and your low tides are going to be lower and then here your high tides are not going to be quite as high but your low tides are going to be a little bit higher. There's going to be a little bit higher low tide as well. So Bottom line is, at the new and full moon, the solar and the lunar tides reinforce each other, making spring tides, the highest tides and lowest tides. At the first and third quarters, the sun and the earth and moon form a right angle, creating neap tides, the lowest highs and the highest lows. So it's the lowest highs and the highest lows. Relative position of the sun, moon, and earth during spring and neap tides. You can see that here. All the new and full moons, or I should say at the new and full moons, the solar and lunar tides reinforce each other, making those spring tides. The highest high and the lowest low. At the first and third quarter, the moon, the sun, and the earth form a right angle, creating neap tides, the lowest high and the highest low tide. Here you can see the tidal record for two cities, New York City and Port Adelaide, Australia, and the impact of the phases of the moon. Remember, at the new moon and the full moon, the sun and the moon are lined up, and that creates additive tides. So the tides are going to be higher. And then at the quarter, you are going to have lower high tides, but your actual low tides will be higher. So there's definite changes between the spring tide and the neap tide, and they all follow the phase of the moon. And again, the moon is not always in the exact same position over the Earth every day. It changes by about 50 minutes. So this all fluctuates uh, with great periodicity, and then you have other factors that determine when high tides and low tides are going to occur. So it's never all exactly the same one day to the next, one month to the next, or one year to the next. The dynamic theory of tides explains the difference between the predictions of the equilibrium theory and the observed tides. So the equilibrium theory would predict one thing. The actual observed tides are something different, and we use the dynamic theory to explain the difference. It recognizes that water covers only three quarters of the planet and is confined to shallow seas and ocean basins that are fixed on the rotating Earth. It also understands the shape of those basins may induce different types of tidal movements, including seiches, water sloshing back and forth, or circular moving tides. It also takes into account the speed of the long wave tide in relatively shallow waters. Tides are always shallow water waves. They always feel the bottom. 
So we have different types of tides, three basic different types of tides, semi-diurnal, diurnal, and mixed tides. And so the word diurnal means daily. Uh, you probably are familiar with the idea of something being nocturnal, something that occurs at night. We oftentimes say that cats are nocturnal animals. They do most of their activity at nighttime. Well, diurnal means daily. And so semi-diurnal means twice a day, or you know, half the day, so twice a day. Diurnal means once a day. And then there's mixed tides. So semi-diurnal tides occur twice in a lunar day. It's in a lunar day. Diurnal tides occur once each lunar day. And then mixed tides describe a tidal pattern with significantly different highs and lows through a cycle. Now, within all basins, there's an amphidromic point, or the amphidromic points, which are also known as nodes. So the amphidromic point or node is a no tide point where the water does not change. At the center of ocean basins, this is where the water level does not change. So here is an illustration globally where you have mixed tides like Los Angeles where you have sometimes high, sometimes low, sometimes higher lows, and sometimes lower lows. Diurnal tides, meaning one high and one low, and that you know, typically happens in the Gulf Basin because the water kind of sloshes back and forth. And then what we have along the East Coast and what you can see along a big chunk of the world's coastlines, the semi-diurnal hides, the semi-diurnal hide where you have uh, one, two high tides and two low tides in any lunar day. So here's the amphidromic circulation. A tide wave crest enters an ocean basin in the northern hemisphere. That is what's happening at A. So a tide wave moves into an ocean basin in the northern hemisphere. The wave trends to the right because of Coriolis effect, causing the high tide on the basin's eastern shore. Unable to continue to the right because of the interference of the shore, the crust then gets deflected northward or to the north and follows the shoreline. That causes a high tide on the basin's northern shore next, then the wave continues its progress around the basin in a counterclockwise rotation, forming a high tide on the western shore third and then completing the circuit. The point at which the crest moves, that point at the center at which the crest moves, is the amphidromic point, or the AP, and that is a point where the water level doesn't change. The tide rotates around that point, and it may be counterintuitive that it rotates counterclockwise because it's being forced to the right or clockwise in the northern hemisphere, but it's not forced at a 90 degree angle. It's forced at about a 45 degree angle. So that wave hits the coast at an angle and is deflected north, and that's why it wraps around the basin counterclockwise. So these are the amphidromic points in all of the world's oceans. And you can see the North Atlantic has one. You have one sort of in the Caribbean. Um, you have one down in the southern parts of the South Atlantic and the Southern Pacific. There's a couple actually in the Pacific Ocean. And each of these amphidromic points are points at which tides rotate around a basin. So tidal ranges generally increasing with increasing distance from the AP. So the further you get away from the amphidromic point, the more you're going to have a range of tides. The colors indicate where tides are most extreme, the highest highs and the lowest lows, with blues being the least extreme and then the reds being the most extreme. And we do have areas where we have extreme high and low tides that are great distances from the APs. White lines radiating from the AP indicate tide waves moving around these points. So there's almost a dozen places on the map where the lines converge. Now those are going to be your APs. Notice how at each of these places, the surrounding color, um, the tidal force in that region is blue, indicating there's little or no apparent tide. That's that, that amphidromic node, that point in which there's no tide, the no tide point. These convergent areas are, are called the amphidromic points. Tide waves move around these points clockwise in the northern hemisphere and counter in I guess it's counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere and then clockwise in the southern hemisphere. Now I should point out this this whole motion around these very specific points is why tides are so different in so many different parts of the world. And these points change over geologic time as our continents and ocean basins slowly change their shape, whether increasing or decreasing in size or changing their shape in general, these no tide points will change as well. It's just an extremely slow process. So tidal patterns vary with ocean basin shape and size. Experience certainly allows the prediction of tide heights to an accuracy 
about an inch, inch, two tenths for, for literally years in advance. The tidal range is the height difference between high tides and low tides. Now, in some inlets um, or other enclosed basins, essentially, you get a tidal phenomenon in which the leading edge of the incoming tide literally forms a wave. So the tide is moving in against water. It's coming in an inlet. And so where a tidal bore forms is where the leading edge of the incoming tide literally forms a wave, or in some cases multiple waves of water, that travel up the river or up narrow bays, and they literally travel against the direction of the river or bay's current. Now, we also have unique tides that occur in bays and in harbors. You have uh, the flood current, which is when the tide is, is crested. You have what's known as ebb current, which is when it's at its lowest point, and then slack water is the time when there's no water moving in or out of the bay or, har or harbor. So when the highest amount of water is in the bay or harbor, you're at a flood current. When the lowest amount, you're at an ebb current. And when you're in between, it's called slack water. So here are some interesting ocean basins uh, and some interesting tidal shapes. So uh, if you look at the open ocean on the left uh, with a, uh, an AP right in the middle of the basin, the water moves into the basin, deflected to the right, strikes the coastline on the east side, and then just travels around that coastline, um, taking 10, 12 hours to occur. You have a similar situation that occurs um, up in the, uh, the Canadian Maritime provinces, um, but the islands and, and the shapes of the coastline deflect and change those tides. And so it's not exactly the equilibrium theory. Here you have to take into account the dynamic theory. So. This uh, tidal range is determined by the basin configuration. So the imaginary AP system in a broad, shallow basin, the numbers indicate the hourly position of the tide crest as the cycle progresses. The AP system for the Gulf of St. Lawrence, again, which is the Canadian Maritimes, between New Brunswick and Newfoundland, southeastern Canada, the dashed line shows the tide heights when the tide is, is passing. So um, you get some pretty significant tide heights moving through this basin because it's enclosed, you have different unusual and unique shapes. And if you look at the bottom left-hand corner, the Bay of Fundy is a, uh, a tidal bay that has one of the largest tidal ranges in the world, where, where there's literally 20 or 30 feet of tidal range that occurs. So in a narrow basin, like uh, you see in that A, there's no AP system. There's really no AP uh, because it's so narrow, so there's no space for rotation. So as we see, like in the Bay of Fundy, the water just comes straight in, and then goes straight back out. And uh, it creates essentially a cease where water rushes up and water rushes down. And you can see there's like a 15 meter tidal range in the Bay of Fundy. Now we are going to talk about tidal patterns and how they affect marine organisms. And within that intertidal zone, the zone where the tide goes from low to high tide, organisms are exposed to varying amounts of emergence and submergence under the water. And so it has a dramatic effect on the type of organisms that can live there, like the grunion, which is a small fish. They time their reproductive behavior to precisely coincide with the tidal cycle so they can get up on shore uh, during very, very low tide and lay their eggs right on shore. And if you ever heard the grunion run in California, these fish flop up on shore right at the edge of the water and literally lay their eggs in the sand. And then as the, as the water rushes back up, so they do it at the lowest tide of the season, and the water comes back up, it covers the fish eggs in water and then the baby eggs, or the baby fish hatch out of those eggs when it's underwater and swim off. And that's the grunion run. And these grunion can time their laying of their eggs precisely to the lowest low tide of the season. And of course, there are lots of other uh, creatures that you find in what are known as tide pools, pools of water that are left behind as tides go up and down. And uh, always find a way to the tide pools and find the urchins and the crabs and the different things, you know, the uh, sea anemone, maybe even the sea cucumbers that you can find in tidal pools. So we also want to talk a little bit about the power that can be extracted from tidal motion, um, trapped high tide water 
can be generated to use electricity. So the tide comes in, so it goes up. It's going up slope. It's being pushed up slope. And so the force of gravity is going to pull it back down as the tide goes low. And we can use that force of gravity in water to create electricity. And the first major tidal power station was opened back in 1966. We've also seen them in South Korea. Essentially, they submerged turbines in open water to allow the, the, the tide pushing back and forth, as they did in Northern Ireland, to drive those turbines. Inch by inch, a new source of energy is emerging, the size of a submarine. Here at the dockside at Leith near Edinburgh, a vast wave power machine. Nearby, mounds of coal. It was coal that fueled the Industrial Revolution. Could sea power be next? And this component is now being lowered into the sea, an operation that will have to be repeated thousands of times at the start of what's being described as a new era of harnessing the power of the sea. Try to follow on. In the assembly hall, I was given the chance to see inside down through the hatch. Oh, it's just like being inside a submarine. It's a strange new technology. So far it's cost some 40 million pounds. Out at sea there'll be no one in here to feel the rocking of the waves. And here at the end of this giant cylinder is where they actually generate the power. Let me show you how that's done. Every time a wave passes along this system the cylinders move, and where they're hinged, there are these huge hydraulic pumps, like bicycle pumps. And that captures the energy of the waves, is channeled into a generator like this, and ends up producing electricity. Cables will bring the power ashore. But what if there are no waves? This thing will be useless on a flat day. On a flat day, we won't produce any power. That's right. But uh, the important thing is the contribution on average over the year. Every megawatt we generate is a megawatt that doesn't need to be provided by fossil fuels. This plan to harness the power of the sea is the largest of its kind in the world. Electricity for 750,000 homes could be produced if all the projects go ahead. That's 1.2 gigawatts, what a conventional power station generates, a bold ambition from the official agency leasing out 10 areas of seabed. This is a very important day. Uh, what we've actually done is taken a very big step to making a new technology, a renewable energy technology, wave and tidal, commercially deployable on a, grand, on a big scale. The designs range from wave machines swaying in the swell to giant turbines spinning in the tides and huge propellers harnessing the currents. Another component is launched. There may yet be unexpected costs or challenges. It's still early days. David Truckman, BBC News, in Leith. So there are some very exciting possibilities with tidal power. They have very low operating costs, and of course, it's a free power source. Now, the low operating cost is to operate the machinery, to build it, to put it in place. That can be expensive. Uh, the biggest disadvantage of tidal power is that even if you built stations in every place in the world where you could use them, you probably would only generate about 1% of the current world needs of energy. So it's not necessarily a worldwide solution uh, to, to power generation, although it may be one solution. So just to uh, summarize, chapter 10, tides are the longest of the ocean's waves. They are forced waves, forced by the combination of gravity from the earth and sun, and that affected by the motion of the earth, the contours and the shape of the ocean basins, and a couple of other factors, uh, and how water tends to move within ocean basins and rock at a specific frequency. All those things are part of the dynamic theory of tides. Unlike other waves, these massive shallow water, very long wavelength waves, are never free of the forces that cause them, so they act in an unusual but generally predictable ways. And again, that's that, that uh, dynamic theory of wave prediction. And uh, basins, as we learn, uh, can uh, resonate, or basin resonances and other factors combine to cause different tidal patterns at different coastlines. Remember, you have diurnal tidal patterns, like an enclosed basin, up, down, one tide high, one tide low each day. Other coastlines, more open coastlines, have semi-diurnal, and then others uh, have mixed tides. So different basins have different types of tides, and the rise and fall of the tides can be used to generate electrical power, uh, and tides are very important in many physical and biological coastal processes. All right, that is going to wrap up Chapter 10. We will see you, or at least... Uh, we'll be together again for chapter 11.